Connect. My name is Kareem Kanji. Thank you for joining us. This is the third installment of our Health Connect interview series. I'm very excited to bring to you uh, one of the co-founders yes. of uh, Komodo Open Lab. This is Maurizio Meza. How are you doing, Maurizio? Hi. Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining me uh, this well. afternoon here in Toronto. Um, many people know that this Health Connect series and study, we're talking about um, health, uh, as well as technology and digital media and social media and how all of these things are impacting uh, health care and the ability for, for people to access health care and the ability for health care to respond uh, to the needs and demands of, uh, of the communities in which they, in which they serve. Um, so let's talk about first what it is that Komodo Open Lab is all about. What is Komodo Open Lab? So we are a social enterprise and our objective is to help people with disabilities access technology. Okay. Um, so we, uh, we uh, my, uh, my uh, business partner and I, we both work in this uh, rehab uh, assistive technology environment for a long time and uh, we found there's a lot of limitation in the current model so we wanted to create a company that can provide access an open technology for people with disabilities in, in a different uh, way than it's been done until now. So you're looking to create technology to allow people with disabilities to use technology? Yes. Why was that important to you? Um, so I guess we have two, two main reasons why. Okay. Uh, so one is because we've been in this environment for a long time working uh, with existing technology Okay. And trying to develop new technology, and what we found is that uh, there's a stall, there is still a lot of uh, limitation of what people can access. Okay. Uh, usually, the assistive technology model follows something uh, that is not really uh, an open market, uh, very innovative space. It, it's mm -hmm. very uh, uh, limited of the devices. Is usually the technology uh, very. Uh, uh, behind mm -hmm. compared to the current uh, technology that we're all, all using. Okay. So our objective is to give access to the same technology that everybody else uses. Okay. Uh, so we, we run a little bit frustrated of, of how the current model is. And the second reason why we are doing this is mm -hmm. because we think that by working in this space yeah. where uh, we're actually working with people that have very particular access needs. Hmm. So by working on this space that it's outside of the mainstream technology, that's where we can make the most uh, benefits to not okay. just these users, but actually create innovative products. Nice. Uh, what's your, I'm curious about your background in this. Was your background uh, in technology in terms of engineering or were you working in health and, and also your co-founder? Yeah, so it's, it's, we're both biomedical engineers. Uh, Biomedical engineer. Yeah, okay. So that's what we did as undergrad. All right. Uh, my experience was a little bit different because after finishing uh, university, I actually worked in a rehab center as a clinician. So I used to oh. work one to one with people with disabilities, trying to find uh, the best technology for their needs. Mm. So it could be computer access, it could be access to phones, or even environmental control systems. So systems that would allow people with disabilities to be able to open doors. Uh, turn lights on and off, control appliances like TVs, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. And Jorge, my business partner, his, his background is more into research. So he's done uh -huh. his PhD in biomedical engineering and he's been more of a developer of assistive devices. Okay. And he's currently a, a researcher at the Inclusive Design Research Center at Oakland University. So this is where our product tech lab uh, was uh, created originally. And that's where we met at the first time. Yes. That was at OCAD, right? Yes. So I'm curious about that journey. Um, and I'm assuming you know you, you didn't kind of walk into OCAD and say, "Hey, I've got an idea. Who wants to work with me?" I'm very curious about you know, you know, as as you were working as a clinician one on one, and you're trying to figure out what sort of needs, you know, did your patients have, and, and how could you solve them right away? And then uh, I'm curious about you know what happened. At that point, we say, you know what? I need to move from this and actually develop a technology that can help people. What was that? What was that thought process? So it was actually interesting because it was like we had two different uh, routes, okay. and, and they just uh, 
got together. Uh, so I was a clinician, but I actually left my work and I okay. wanted to do something different. So I went to business school. So I did okay. my MBA. And during my MBA, I had to come up with an idea for a business plan. And yeah. Based on my experience, I thought mobile devices are the future. Yeah. Uh, and their, their access to mobile devices for people with disabilities is very limited especially for people with mobility impairments, so people that are not able to use touchscreen devices. Okay. So there's a need in the market for a product like uh, uh, an interface for people with very limited mobility to control a smartphone. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I did a little bit of research during the school, I started a business plan uh, and that's where it ended for in that, at that point. And then when I finished the school, I talked to people I knew, I talked to Jorge, and we start talking and it turned out that he actually had a proof of concept of, Interesting. of the product I was doing some market research about. Okay. So that's when we decided to form the company and start looking at commercializing that, uh, that proof of concept. Very interesting. What, what year was this? Uh, that was 2010. 2010. So probably what, 2009 you, were, you put together this business plan, mm -hmm. 2010 you leave school, you start working, you meet Jorge and just, hey, this is what I'm doing. You say, but this is what I want to do too. And you gotta join forces. Yep. Uh, so we we start working together. Uh, I start doing more of the business planning, okay. uh, doing market research, and just contacting other uh, agencies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like government uh, agencies that would maybe supporting the product. Uh, also with clinics to see what was the interest they would have on, on commercializing this or. or recommending it to the users. So that's how we started it. And at this point, were you in OCAD? Were you like accepted as a, as um, a business, as a cohort? No, at that, at that point, I, I guess that's the point when we went to OCAD and said, Look, okay, this is what we have, the proof of concept. This is what we want to commercialize. And that's when they said, okay, we will have uh, space. You okay. guys can start working from here. And yeah. any, any help we can provide you, well, just, just that. So what was that experience like working at OCAD? Well, it's actually a, it's a very interesting space. You have uh, people from all these different backgrounds that, that uh, I think it's a very creative place. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you have, it, it's, I guess it's different than any other institution in terms of that you have uh, limits, right? In OCAD, you have no limits of what you can create. Uh, interesting. You're, you're working with artists, the yeah, it's media, creative uh, arts and design yes, uh, space. So the, the actual institute where this was created is the Inclusive Design Research Center. So what they do is they do research on uh, web accessibility mm -hmm. and uh, uh, technology. How can you include people with special needs uh, into technology? So that's kind of the kind of research work that they are doing and that's uh, how we, we started it. Interesting. And now I understand you're at the Ryerson Digital Media Zone. Yeah, so now that uh, we, we are a little bit further in our process, we already have uh, like our first uh, user-friendly version, so we can actually start growing. And because uh, the digital media zone is pretty, I think, one of the, the more fastest growing incubators in the city. Yeah. And I, I was a Ryerson uh, student, so we approached them and they were really interested and they, they took us into their incubator. So mm -hmm. that's where we are working from. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm curious about, you know, your discussions with um, clinics in terms of, you know, is this something that you would use? Would you be willing to purchase that you know how was that how were those conversations and then what did you find out what is it that they were really looking for uh, and were you already taking that into account or were these new insights that you used to build your product um it, it's different depending on the location because okay. we have uh, clinics in canada yeah uh, and clinics in the uk for example okay and these clinics were mostly with government funding so there is okay. actually a lot of support for people with disabilities to be able to acquire devices. Mm. So in these clinics, the main concern is, is this gonna be approved by the funding agency to be purchased by our users? Yeah. Uh, that's usually the main concern. Mm -hmm. um, but they are really interested in using it. Um, in the US, that, that's our another big market, it's different because there's not that many uh, funding available. Uh, as it is in Canada or in the UK, so 
their concerns are a little bit different. They are more into uh, how can we cheap it, can we uh, buy it cheaper, or uh, how can it be uh, done that uh, you can reduce the cost for the end user because they have uh, the end user have less uh, uh, funds to, mm -hmm. to purchase assistive devices sure, out sure. of their pocket. Yeah, they're they're uh, dealt a bad hand, so to speak, not just in their ability to use a product, but then at the same time their ability to be uh, part of uh, society based upon society's needs mm -hmm. for uh, you know for types of workforces. Um, I really like your co-founder's quote here on the website. Uh, Jorge Silva, co-founder, says, "Disability is not an illness, but the product of bad design and discrimination." Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm wondering, I know you didn't say it, but Ori said it, and I'm sure you guys are thinking along the same lines. You know, what, what does he mean by that? Is, is, it that is, is it that it's designed for able-bodied people, or really, you know, what is he, what is he getting at there? Uh, well, like usually we say uh, people with disabilities, right? And, yeah. And this is because, uh, as, as anybody else, we are all different. Mm -hmm. And if you think, if you cannot complete an action, uh, to do something. For example, if I wouldn't have my glasses, I might not be able to read something that is far away. So that's, sure. that would be my disability. Sure. But as soon as I have a, a assistive device with my glasses to put it, yeah. that's not a, a, an issue anymore. So sure. I overcome that disability. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can apply to everything else. If a person cannot uh, go into a building because mm -hmm. there are steps, then there's an there's a obstacle. So there, if you are able to overcome that obstacle mm -hmm. somehow, uh, then you are on the other side and you, you don't have that disability, that challenge anymore. True. Just to give you an example, uh, that's something uh, I, that it amazed me. Is, uh, I had one, one of our former clients, uh, she, she went back to school but she took an online course. Okay. Uh, she was using highly adapted uh, devices to control her computer. Head operated mouse, uh, speech recognition systems, uh, a zip and pop device to, to be able to click. Uh, but in the online world, mm -hmm. uh, she had no, there was no difference between her work and her, uh, her classmates. And the funny thing is that the professor asked them to share their uh, bibliography so everybody could see what dictionaries they were using. She was an yeah. uh, English uh, editing uh, class. Sure. So she posted her books, and the students noticed that she was using ebooks. But for them, they just in their conversation said, "Oh, you're like kind of like the future." There was a couple of years ago when ebooks were not that popular, and uh, because she was using electronic book, but nobody actually knew the reason why she was using electronic book. Sure. So when you are in that space, mm -hmm. uh, differences are non-existent, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what Jorge is saying, that if you design things to be accessible, if you allow everybody to have a way in, mm -hmm. then there's no disability. There's no right. such thing as disability. That's fantastic. Um, and, and I know he's given a TEDx talk uh, about, about your approach to development of in these inclusive technologies. And uh, I'm going to make sure that we post that as mm -hmm. well um, onto our website. Uh, but let's get to, uh, I guess, your first product. Yes. Uh, that, that you guys have built called uh, Tecla. Um, does Tecla mean something specifically or...? Well, Tecla means key in Spanish. Key. So like okay. a key of a keyboard. Okay. Uh, so what basically uh, Tecla is, uh, it's, it's a keyboard uh, for your phone that it's accessible. Uh, okay. So that's how we, we could uh, describe it. So, you know, to control a computer, to control a phone, mm -hmm. you need a, a keyboard. Okay. So Tecla, it's a keyboard that it's accessible. Okay. And it's accessible through assistive devices. Uh, so basically, what it is, um, there's hardware. There's a piece of hardware that mm -hmm. we call it the Tecla Shield, and that's an interface that can integrate into other assistive devices. So it can uh, connect to wheelchairs. Uh, we'll just have an output port so that can connect to that, or it can connect to adaptive device, adaptive switches. So it could be something as simple as a big button. Okay. That someone could be hitting with their heads uh, or sure. with their shoulders yeah. uh, to something more complicated like a zip and pop switch where you blow and zip to control the device or even uh, a blinking switch or a myoelectric switch. So all those kind of interfaces can be used to control the phone. So the, mm. the tech actually connects to the phone wirelessly via Bluetooth 
and just sends command and the phone interprets those command and does an action like moving down, moving up, next, right, uh, or even selecting and typing. So Tecla is enabling these individuals to start using smartphones. Yes, so basically, yeah, Fantastic. Tecla allows anyone with uh, very limited mobility to access smartphones and tablets. When was this developed? How, how, how late was this developed? Uh, so the first uh, proof of concept, as I said, was developed in early in the summer of 2010. Okay. Uh, then we did some bet, uh, have uh, some testers uh, mm -hmm. from different rehab centers here in Toronto and in Vancouver, and from that uh, we created the first uh, user friendly version. So mm -hmm. we incorporated a battery pack, we incorporated a mounting system to mm -hmm. incorporate easily into wheelchairs. Um, so that's when it was uh, it was first available for sale in uh, earlier this year in February. I think. Okay. And the second version for iOS devices was released in May. In May. Um, I'm, I'm I'm curious about you know you you know some people are developing apps. Mm. You know you guys are actually developing hardware. Um, how how difficult is that in terms of you know. Uh, accessing funding or accessing support when really you're building new hardware to for people to actually be able to use some of these more popular smartphones so it's definitely a challenge uh, it's it's definitely more complicated to develop hardware than software uh, yeah there are many things to consider in terms of like even compliance testing for the device and sure completed um, and I, I don't I guess investors are also looking into products that would be more like web-based, app-based, that could yeah. be easily... Uh, easy to sell, easy, easy to, to talk sell, about, yeah, large market. Yeah, exactly. So this is also, um, so not only are you building hardware, software and hardware, mm -hmm. uh, to connect with, with smartphones, specifically with the Tecla product, uh, but your market you know, according to investors, would be very limited, and not very what they what uh, you know. I'm assuming as as an outsider, you know, we'll look on it. You know, it's a fantastic product. It, it fills a need. It's very noble, uh, but the market is very small. It, so I'm curious if if these conversations have ever come up with yeah, uh, with investors or supporters. So more than a uh, small market, it's a niche market. It's a niche uh, market. And, okay. Uh, one of the the big. Uh, Usually in assistive devices, one of the big challenges to, to make a global company mm -hmm. is the price of the device. It, it's a big uh, okay. loop yeah. that assistive devices turn out because usually you develop a product and then you, you want to uh, get it approved for funding. Mm -hmm. So you take it to uh, different funding agencies for approval. But okay. most times they, they look at it and they say, oh, this is not... Uh, just for people with disabilities. Interesting. Can you adapt it? Okay. So then you take your time, you take it back to uh, the drawing board, and then you make something that you created from scratch that is specific for people for disabilities, but then that process actually increased the price because you started from scratch. Uh, so then... Starting to modify it. Yeah, so then the device uh, turns out to be expensive for users to buy out of their pocket, mm -hmm. so then they, they do need the funding uh, from the government. So it becomes a loop, and those uh, funding agencies are usually uh, very localized, very uh, based on region. So just to give you an example, in Ontario there is a funding uh, program for assistive devices. In Quebec they have a different system, and the rules are ah. not even similar. Uh, Alberta may have a different system. So healthcare is a provincial domain. So yeah, exactly, and that happens everywhere, right? Yeah. Even in England they have the NHS system that may yeah. not have it. So I'm more curious, uh, Mauricio, about you know developing the technology and going for funding. Say, hey, we need X amount of dollars to help us build this, yeah. or so to help invest in a in, in, in a factory. In the same, uh, uh, the, I guess our objective, and mm -hmm. that's why it makes it a global uh, uh, company. Yeah. It's instead of going that route of creating an assistive device specifically mm -hmm. for people with disabilities, our approach is to taking advantage of mainstream devices, so yeah. that's why we work with Android devices, uh, iOS devices. Yeah. So our approach is to give access uh, to mainstream technology. 
Uh, and that has uh, many benefits. One for users is uh, they can benefit from the commodization of technology. So mm -hmm. now we can go to any future shop, Best Buy, any or any wireless carrier, and get a phone for almost fifty dollars with the plan, or even free. Sure. So that's something that usually our users would not have been able to take advantage because they would need a specialized phone that would cost nine hundred dollars. Now they can so, access that utilizing. Yeah, so by taking that uh, into account, so they only need to buy our interface to be able to access that phone. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually makes the market a lot bigger. Uh, and the second uh, reason is that uh, these devices now, they will need to be accessible because of accessibility uh, legislation. So in Canada and in the US, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is new legislation coming into place. In Canada, the CRT system, wireless coverage, you must have assist, uh, accessible devices, accessible handsets, because if not, you are discriminating a big part of the population. That uh, that's very that's, that's very insightful, very interesting. So, are, are are you able to now, for example, connect with Rogers, Telus, Bell, uh, and say, here's who we are, and here's why it's important for us to meet? Yeah. So that's exactly our approach. Our that's approach nice. is go with wireless coverage. And I said, you need to do this. Yeah. We already have it. We already have it. So in that case, that's... They are now your client. Uh, potentially, yeah. yeah. So we're working with a few of the carriers here in Canada, the US uh, and Europe in, uh, in promoting this as the solution for people with mobility impairments. Mm -hmm. uh, also in the US, they have the 21st Century Accessibility Act. Uh, okay. And uh, by October of next year, all devices that connect to the internet will have to be accessible as and well. Again, yes. So again, you can approach Samsung, uh, whatever uh, manufacturers have said, you need to comply with these. We yeah. already have a solution for you. That's amazing. That's really, really amazing. Um, what's, what's next for you guys? Like, you know, is, is it just getting as many of these uh, Tecla Shields in the hands of as many individuals and clinics and, and wireless carriers and, and ISPs as possible? Yeah, so that we're all right now is to, to, to keep growing the market, to mm -hmm. keep uh, reaching out to consumers, uh, a very important uh, group that we are targeting okay. is rehab professionals, we rehab have centers, because okay. they are usually the ones that, the gatekeepers for mm. for information, Sure. Uh, so a lot of people would go and ask, what can I use to control the phone, mm -hmm. so they, they, we want to make them aware of our solution, Yeah. but they are also gatekeepers for funding, a lot of times they, they can access funding from like uh, non-for-profit organizations, yeah. government organizations, and help people, our our end users, to get the device uh, ready. That's very interesting. Uh, are you guys looking at just focusing on making the Tecla Shield even better, or are you guys looking at building it, uh, other products as well? So right now we're focused on the Tecla Shield okay. and uh, and the software. So with the software, we we plan to do a lot of the new features. Uh, okay. Uh, we we keep uh, improving the app for mm -hmm. Android as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new release, big release coming up soon. Uh, and the hardware, we're also adding a couple of features. Right now, it's mostly taking what we have right now and making it better, okay. uh, making it more efficient mm -hmm. uh, and smaller because it does it does have an impact because a lot of our users have it in their wheelchair, so the more compact it can be, uh, the better setup yeah. they can have. That is, that is so true. It's been a very interesting two, almost three years. Yeah, it's been a lot of work. <laughs> and, and, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, as, as someone in the startup field, you know, how, how do you feel, you know, developing something that, you know, it's not the next Angry Birds, but it's, it's something that makes a level playing field for everybody. Yeah. So, um, it's funny, I was at one of the startups event and someone said, you're actually solving a problem. Yes. So when I hear that, that's, that's, yeah. that's what keeps us working and try to make it better. Uh, we recently uh, we ship a unit to Australia and we just saw the wow. tweet of the mom of the kid that started using it saying, for the first time ever, my 16 year old called me on his own. Wow. So yeah, you're making a difference. You're, you're making, you might, you know, it's, it's, you know, some people take a look at that quote, I think, by, uh, uh, by, by Apple co-founder Steve Jobs where, where he says, you know, wanting to make a dent in the universe. 
Um, and then a lot of people take a look at that quote and say that means you must have so many, so much of sales or you know so many users. Uh, but I think what you guys are doing, you know, even if it makes a difference in one person's life, uh, I think something like this, like like you've been told many times, you're actually making a difference. Uh, you know, you allow a mother to finally get a phone call yeah. from her son, uh, and that's fantastic. And, and, and we wish you all the best in, 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 in what it is that you guys are doing at Komodo Open Lab. And we look forward to following your journey and seeing what happens there. Um, how can people find out more about what it is you guys are doing? Uh, they can visit our website, uh, www.komodoopenlab.com. Fantastic. Uh, I think we have a mailing list. We can uh, keep them updated in any developments. Uh, yeah. And uh, follow us on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Komodo Open Lab. At Komodo Open Lab, fantastic. Mauricio, thank you so much well, thanks for, having me. for joining us. We really appreciate it. Again, Mauricio Meza, co founder of Komodo Open Lab.com. Also, check him out at Komodo Open Lab. And I invite all of you uh, to please come out and check us out at uh, our Health Connect panel discussion on October 24th here in Toronto. For more information, go to healthconnect.eventbrite.com. Uh, where you will hear everything that's going on uh, here in the country at the very least about technology, digital and social and, and the health industry. Uh, thank you again for joining us and we look forward to talking with you soon. Bye-bye.